My name is Tucker Johnson, and I am your host today as we experience NIMSY Live, where we talk about the latest and greatest in translation, localization, internationalization, culturalization, and all that fun stuff global companies need to delight their international customers or at least not piss them off too much. On this program, we invite guests who like to have fun and have some value to add for our audience of globalization professionals. I'm always eager to provide a platform to those with a good story or a good data set. So let us know if there are any topics you would like covered or guests we should reach out to for future episodes. If you haven't already done so, make sure that you're subscribed to NIMSY Insights. You can follow us on LinkedIn and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, all of the social medias, Instagram, we are out there. And whatever platform you are watching us on today, if you hit that subscribe or follow button, then you are going to be one of the first to be notified when we publish new research or when we schedule new live streams like this. First of all, a little bit about the platform. We're doing this as a live stream on LinkedIn because that's where our audience is. We're coming to you from a new time zone today. We're talking about the APAC region. So um, a lot of our regular attendees won't be able to watch us, but hopefully you guys are catching us on the recording. If so, make sure to hit that like button, comment, and tag us, and we can get back to your, your comments even if we can't address them live. Quick introduction to today's topic. In China, localization is different. In today's episode, we are going to talk to Zhang Chuan Ge about the complexities of localizing in China. Some topics that we're going to be looking at include technology in China in the past for Chinese users only, technology in China now, born global. We're going to talk about what that means to be born global, key points to make better product localization, and the bright side of product localization in China. About Zhang Jun. Zhang Jun is a leading product localization. He is uh, leading the product localization team at ByteDance, and before that, he was Airbnb's first localization manager in China. And he founded Panda Translation, a Beijing based boutique LSP. He is also the most influential localization evangelizer in China with over 7,000 followers across all platforms. With that, welcome to the show, Zhang Jun. Nice to meet you. What did I leave out in my introduction? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, I, I thank you, Tucker. You've you made a very comprehensive introduction of me, and uh, it, it is my great pleasure to talk to you over over Nimzi Live, and uh, to meet all uh, localization professionals around the world, especially in China, maybe. <laughs> Especially in China. Well, welcome to the show and welcome if you're joining us from China or anywhere from around the world. If you guys um, leave comments in the comment section, then we will bring them up here on screen. Hopefully, I'll be able to get that working. Um, so go ahead and leave comments, questions for us throughout the program. We have a special treat today because... I'm spoiled as a host. My life has been made super easy because... We have a whole presentation here that was prepared by Zhang Quan. So thank you very much for that. I want to keep this pretty conversational and go through things as we normally would. This is a podcast format. And also there's there's listeners that might be listening as a podcast rather than viewing the live stream. But I thought we could just go through this, this presentation here that you've put together. Going global and product localization in China. I've always already introduced you. Ex Airbnb curator of product loc on WeChat, founder of Panda Translation and Season Translator. So today you wanted to go through, as I mentioned in the introduction, we're going to talk about technology in the past, what that means, um, how they've, how you you guys have done that in the past at China. We're going to talk about what it means to be born global and how that's affecting the way Chinese companies approach product localization now. Um, talk about some key points for better product localization and the bright side of product localization in China. So take it away here. Tech in China in the past for Chinese users only. First of all, before we go into, into the next conversation here, what does that mean for Chinese users only? What do you mean by that? Uh, you know, when I, when I first... Uh, get got in contact with internet with the internet. I 
was it was around 1999. So basically, uh, it's almost the same time uh, as in the U.S. as in the world. So uh, you know, so that that means China tech companies rose from that time. So all the developments are like in at the in at, at the same pace as the mm. uh, overseas counterparts. But uh, uh, you know, China is a unique market, and uh, uh, they 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 went through a different routes. Like um, for for Chinese companies, because China market is so big and with so many people, and uh, the internet pen, internet penetration uh, grew uh, so so much in the past twenty years. So uh, tech companies in China mostly are serving Chinese users only. Well, I... and uh, going going uh, going global uh, was not a thing. Before, because you didn't have before, to a few years ago, right? And and that's that's the thing. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're it's right. Like, I, I deal with this a little bit here in the U.S. Is a lot of Americans we don't think internationally because we're a big country and we don't have to, right? Where it's not like we're a European country where we have neighbors on all side of us, and if I get in my car and drive for an hour, I'm in a different country. Yeah. And China's like the U.S. on steroids. Yeah. Is it's such a big market that companies could make yeah. a really good living for themselves without having to worry about globalization, right? Yeah, but but uh, the maybe the the another big difference uh, between U.S. market and the Chinese China market is that in the U.S. you have immigrants from. All over the world. Fair. Yeah. So um, even if you are building uh, an app, building products for U.S. markets only, but uh, you have to take those users into consideration. But for China, you don't have to, because uh, like um, more than ninety percent people in China, of all people, or of all one point four billion uh, people in China. Uh, our 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 hand yeah ethnic group exactly so you don't need to so worry you don't about have to worry about different... mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah well i see let's let's go on here you've got you're mm -hmm. gonna put me on the spot here question for Tucker. yeah 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 i got a question for you all right what's your question for me yeah, what are the top four tech companies in China, in okay. your opinion? So full disclosure, I did see these slides before the presentation, but I, I tried not to Google it here. So I'm going to guess Alibaba, Baidu, Tencent. I don't know, because I'm not sure who owns what. Like WeChat, but WeChat's owned by Tencent. So, okay. Yeah, WeChat is from Tencent. Dang it, dang it. So I got, I, I can't think of a fourth one then. So let's see how I did here. Yeah, mate. All yeah, right, yeah. I got Alibaba. We got Baidu, Tencent, and what is this? What is the what is uh, the last one I'm missing? Xiaomi. Xiaomi. Xiaomi smartphone. Oh. Manufacturer. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> sh 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 Surprising. Sh I was ignorance. surprised. Yeah. Actually, I was surprised by really? the by the bad ticks. Uh, yeah, I was but uh, surprised by that. Uh, uh, term mm -hmm. uh, because before that, before I preparing uh, pre pre prepared prepared for this uh, live, I didn't know that there is a term called BATX. <laughs> that's but, but, but that's true. new to me. Enlighten me. What is BATX? Oh, that's the that's uh, Baidu, the. You can you can go back to the previous yeah. Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, and uh, oh. Xiaomi X. Oh, now I can remember it since so, I got this nice little tool to remember it. Yeah. Yeah, and you can see that uh, most of them, like Baidu, Tencent, and Alibaba, they found it around the dot-com bubble. Okay. So you say yeah. in the last 20 years, they defined the tech scene in everyone's life in China. And I, you know, I've worked with Chinese colleagues throughout the year and have a general yeah. understanding of what that looks like. But for folks, you know, for for my parents who might watch this, who know nothing about the tech scene in China, 
What does that look like? Mm -hmm. I mean, because I don't think people fully grasp how pervasive technology is and how much um, how much control it ha not control, but how how pervasive it is in everyday life. Yeah, uh, I think the major difference uh, of tech scenes between uh, uh, China and other companies are like um, in China we have mega apps like uh, a WeChat, like mm -hmm. uh, Alipay, the two two biggest mega app that I, I think Elon Musk uh, kind uh, of envies. He wants, he wants that. He app. wants to yeah. turn Twitter into yeah, that. Yeah, I think. So, yeah, so my he, understanding he, he is. Uh, X Corp, yeah. Yeah, my, my understanding yeah. is that in China is WeChat is everything. Like people use it for everything, whereas yeah. in the U.S. Yeah, we everything. have Almost. one app to call an Uber. We have a different app to text our friends. Mm -hmm. We have a different app to send money. We have a different app to buy stuff. We have a different app to make a reservation yeah. for a movie. Yeah, for and social. For social media, traveling, all of these different things. Yeah. And in China, everything's yeah. just centralized so that people can like... Mm. Is it possible to even like what happens if you don't have access to your app? If your phone dies, like how do you get around? <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, in the past, people manage all their um, contacts on their phones, uh -huh. on their in their phone contacts. But uh, since 2011, I think the day the the year that uh, WeChat born was born, everyone's using WeChat as their contact management. And all their friends are on WeChat. And all their uh, friends and uh, business partners, clients are so, on So you got to have it. It's not a nice to have. You got to have it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I heard that uh, uh, someone who's running a, a small, small business in China, mm. all, their, all of her clients are on WeChat. Mm. And uh, all these clients came from WeChat. Oh, wow. Or were, were connected via WeChat. It's yeah, like... because you have CRM, uh, CRM systems built on uh, WeChat. Wow. So WeChat, WeChat is everything. So... <laughs> <laughs> it's basically everything. So, yeah, yeah. If you want to get, get to people, if you want to uh, connect with people, connect with uh, clients, and uh, connect with uh, 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 potential clients like generation uh, leads at leads generation you you have to rely on wechat and it, i'm assuming that's true for foreign companies that want to do business in china as well i mean yeah that's where the consumer is yeah that's where the buyer is yeah of course yeah talk to me about um tmd the new tech giants in china yeah, yeah. the t comes from comes from toutiao okay. a product uh built by by this and uh, M means Meituan and B means DD. So all these uh, three giants, we call it little giants, were born around 2010s. So uh, like May on Meituan, you can you can book, or you can buy, buy everything. You can get delivery, uh, 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 food delivery. You can get tickets, you can buy whatever tickets, like travel, like flight, flight ticket, train oh. ticket, boat ticket, everything. You can buy everything from uh, big malls or from restaurants and everything. And by using DD, you can uh, go everywhere, go anywhere. Like uh, you can uh, travel within a city using the Uber-like services service and you can also uh, go from one city to another using uh, like um, hitch hacker, hitch hacking oh, wow. service on it. So yeah. one thing I'm noticing and here is- With ByteDance, you know. Hmm. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. One, one thing I'm noticing here, and I think this is kind of the moral of the story that you're trying to tell us here, for China users only. So in the past, We've got um, BAT, BATX, uh, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, and Zhang Hong. Sorry, I can't pronounce things. Um, yeah, Xiaomi. 
Alipay, Alibaba, Baidu. I'm not. These are all Chinese companies that are focused specifically on the Chinese market, right? So these are companies that every Chinese person yeah. has heard of before, and a lot of people outside of China perhaps haven't even heard of before. And I think this illustrates your point that in the past, even up to these companies that were founded more recently, about ten years ago. Is mm -hmm. there's been a strong focus on the Chinese market, and what? Why is that? Yeah. Why? What? Um, we talked about it a little bit, but you make the point here that they know Chinese users best. How does that help them? How does that hurt them? Yeah, um, because China market is so big and with so many consumers, so uh, they can easily get profitable. And uh, because of the mega apps, uh, they can quickly uh, pick off the business. Because when when everyone, almost all the internet users in China are on WeChat, mm -hmm. all you need to do for kicking off a business is to make announcement. So it's easy. They know how to do WeChat. it. They they know their users. Yeah. Right? Yeah. How does that yeah. and how does that translate into product design? Yeah, like um, like East East Asian uh, East Asian uh, users, like uh, China Chinese users, Korean uh, users, and Japanese users, they tend to be uh, information craving. Okay. So, meaning that uh, before making decisions, they want to gather as much information as possible. So, and all these languages, texts, scripts are like Jap Chinese, Japanese, Korean scripts are tense, uh, denser, space wise. So they pack more information. So you can see that, yeah, more packed. Yeah. So uh, with all these characters, you can uh, use a sm short, short phrase to sp express a long, meaningful uh, things. So the, the, the design can be denser comparing to other uh, European or US apps. So, and that's probably a big difference from, I think a lot of Western design is very minimalistic, not have a lot of text on yeah. screen, right? And that probably drives you guys crazy. Yeah, you don't, want, you don't want to be overwhelmed, but uh, for East Asian users, you ha you're, you're fine. You have to. to. Overwhelm them. Well, because they're yeah. used to it. I mean, you have a you have a slide here on um, expansion mm -hmm. when when localizing into English. Yeah. So that if you have five to ten characters, and then you translate that into English, your text could expand by two hundred percent. You literally cannot fit the same amount of information on screen if you once you localize. Yeah, that. yeah. So all these all these understandings to uh, local Chinese users. Um, impediment impediments uh, uh, be become impediments for for these tech companies because when they are trying to go 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 global they have found that oh my past experience doesn't work ah so yeah design is one of the examples so so it, this is one of the one of the excuses or one of the reasons they can say well we're not going to do localization because it's it's too hard. It doesn't translate well. So we'll just focus on our home market, which I, I love this meme. Yeah. Product localization? No. <laughs> so that's the past. Yes, because they don't need to. Because they yeah. don't need to. In the past. Right. So that's the past yeah. for, for Chinese um, organizations. Let's move into the future here. Um, moving on to part two, tech in China now, born global. Tell me, what does this mean to be born global? What are we talking about the, with that? I mean, um, because of many reasons, the tech companies in China, they cannot easily get profitable in China. So they have to go global. They have to expand into other markets. I mean the same reason to anybody grow. the same reason anybody decides to localize in the new markets. Yeah, but because... but it was not the case in the past. 
Right, because so, the market wasn't saturated now, yet. Now it is. But now they're getting to that point. Yeah. So, I mean, part... Yeah. Of course, uh, part one is for money. Number of internet users in China from 2012 to 2022 keeps going up, but yes. there's always there's always more out there for policy reasons. Yeah. Um. Oh. Yeah. I know this is interesting. So, we were talking about this beforehand. Also, um. <laughs> talk to me about uh yeah. crypto and gaming. Yeah. Uh. Uh. Crypto currency and uh, uh, gaming. Uh, are going global for different reasons. Um, so cryptocurrency now is a strictly regulated uh, business, not only in China, but also in the Europe or other yeah. regions. Yeah. Um, yeah, so so when when Chinese uh, government said that no, no current cryptocurrency business in China, they have to go global, go global, go overseas. And for gaming is that uh, to publish a game uh, in China, you have to get license. So uh, sometimes it's hard for uh, to get the license. So uh, when you're wait on the waiting list to get the license, the other option is to go global. So to release the game first in overseas markets. So a Chinese game developer may actually release their game in foreign markets before it's available Earlier. in China. Yeah. That is interesting. Yeah. Well, that's a good incentive yeah. to go global. So yeah. The, so these companies that, and this is the new market. And I, I've seen this too with, you know, not just Chinese companies, but I, I think like companies like Microsoft, in the past, and by past, mm -hmm. I mean 20, 30, maybe 40 years. I don't know how old Microsoft is, but a long time ago, um, mm -hmm. kind of went through this. And yeah. I, I used to talk about this more, the difference between, you know, companies that were started, you know, started out as a domestic company, and then they decided we need to go and service foreign markets, and then companies that were mm. more recent who started out as they were born global, essentially. They started out as a global company. And you look at a company like Microsoft, yeah. and you know they started out servicing in English, and then translation was very much kind of an afterthought. And you look at more recent companies yeah. that are founded these days, and translation is localization and international strategy it is a prerequisite before they even get yeah. started. I've worked with startups that, you know, as soon as yeah. as soon as they're developing the English, they're simultaneously developing the the international versions as well. And it looks like this yeah. is this is what's happening in China too, with some of these companies. Yeah. I, I I recognize Anchor. I recognize how many TikTok. how many of them um, do you, do you know? Um, yeah, TikTok Anchor, is one of TikTok, them, of course, everyone other? knows TikTok. Um, Shine. Yeah. I think I recognize Shine. Yeah. What does Shine do? Shine is a, a quick fashion, fast fashion. Okay. I, I recognize Shine because I get ads for them on China Facebook. China part of H&M. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, I, I get ads for them on Facebook. That's the only reason I recognize Shine. Um, but these others I don't recognize. Yeah. So these are these are companies. DJI. That, DJI, you know DJI, DJI, no. What do they do? The drone company. No, I do drones. now. I do now. Timu. Yeah. What is Timu? Timu. Timu. Uh, Timu is a shopping marketplace. Okay. And one... yeah, it it, it invest, invested uh, many a lot of money on in Super Bowl. Okay. A while ago. <laughs> I didn't watch. Yeah. So that's probably. And OnePlus is a, a smartphone manufacturer like Xiaomi, and Anchor is a uh, is a charger. I know Anchor. Power bank. Anchor makes great products. I I love Anchor. Yeah, yeah. Anchor I know. chargers. That's yeah. like all I buy anymore. Yeah. So these these guys yeah. are born like global. all these. Yeah, all these brands and products they uh, the the they went global at their uh, right after their uh, foundation right. or uh, going global market 
was one of their uh, was their major goal, I'd say, when when they found it. So all these companies, uh, so I say they are born global. So they take care of uh, all these uh, localization elements uh, in their from in, day one in, in the early early stage. Yeah, yeah, from day one. And it makes and it makes uh, but, but your job course, a lot easier. They, 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 <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, yeah. So so many people in China, including these uh, brands, uh, they they regard local product localization as translation only. Mm -hmm. Translating mm -hmm. uh, texts from English to other languages, or even from Chinese directly into other languages, but uh, yeah, uh, a while later they learned the lesson. Yeah, that's the thing. Is uh, sooner or later you're going to learn that lesson. You can either learn it the easy way, yeah. which is by learning from the people that came before you and the mistakes other past companies have made. Or you can learn it the hard way, yeah. which is you end up making those mistakes yes. and it costs more money to fix them than, than if you had just done it right the first yes. time. Yeah. So, so let's, let's talk about uh, better product localization, um, key points to make better product localization. And I think a lot of these are some universal truths throughout product localization, but I'd love to get yeah. your perspective from the Chinese yeah. product localization standpoint. Um, mm -hmm. One, awareness of product localization within the org. Oh, you're preaching my language here. See, this, this transcends borders <laughs> because this is something that is useful. I don't care if you're in China or if you're in Africa or Europe, wherever you are. Awareness yeah. of product Even localization. Even European or uh, US companies. Exactly. It's also the truth. And we work with a lot of companies here at NIMSY. I say a lot, but, you know, mm. we work with companies here at NIMSY. Yeah. They're clients of ours. And, you know, when we're a consulting company, we help people. We advise on, we, we do a lot. But one of the things we do is advise them yeah. on their, um, how to mature their localization programs. And one of, and, yeah. uh, in part of that, we go through and we understand what are the pain points, like what are the challenges that they're facing? And one of the like universal challenges that localization departments face in their organizations is that there's no awareness of localization internally. People don't understand, people yeah. within the organization, they don't understand what localization is. They don't recognize it as a revenue driver. They just think it's a cost driver. And so localization yeah, exactly. departments, we spend a lot of time justifying our own existence. Persuading or convincing right. people. Right. So yeah. would you say at these, um, this is a differentiator for the born global companies, you know, companies like, like TikTok, for example. Um, yeah, I, I think, uh, I think, I think, uh, uh, we don't. We can put put the uh, cost center or revenue center apart, aside, and but uh, the basic uh, idea of what localization is is uh, needs to be educated all the time. Yeah. And how how have yeah. you seen? Do you have any interesting stories? How have you seen? What are some effective strategies for doing that? Because it's one thing to say localization managers need to educate their stakeholders. They need to evangelize localization internally. What are some concrete strategies yeah. that you've found are effective when you're faced with that situation? Mm, because I worked at Airbnb um, China as the first localization manager. Mm -hmm. So uh, my experience is that uh, when you uh, first, uh, the localization department in Chinese tech companies is a rare case. So not so many uh, tech companies in China has an independent localization localization department. Most probably they will have a have someone in charge of localization. So uh, for that, you need to um, to to build the trust within the work that localization is a profession mm -hmm. localization is not an easy job so you need to 
uh, make a, make a case, make make even make make make, make cases yep. to let people believe that product localization needs one more than one person. And I think that that word trust is probably universal, no matter what company you're working at. I, I, however, yeah. I think the path to trust can look different in different companies. Some companies are very data driven. Yeah. And so in order to build yeah. trust, it means putting together a good business case, showing them the data, um, tracking the, yeah. the ROI, the return on investment of localization, right? These are these are what some companies yeah. need to see. In in other companies, I think trust yeah. is um, you can get to trust through <laughs> basically kind of the old fashioned way, just relationship building. It's all about mm -hmm. relationships. Um, uh, yeah. The company culture at some organizations is very relationship driven. And so what that looks yeah. like is holding um, information sessions with different organizations. We work with some client side organizations where they actually have um, monthly newsletters that the globalization team will publish mm -hmm. and only their internal newsletters. No no one external, just people inside the company. And they've been doing this for, yeah. for years and we'll help them put together mm -hmm. the content for it. And it's just an ongoing education of, hey, here's what we're doing in the localization department this month. And by the way, here's how it affects the end client satisfaction. Here's how mm -hmm. it affects metrics that yeah. matter to User you. User experience. You, User experience, yeah. user experience. I, I tell people, you know, working with localization managers, localization managers want to talk about, you know, LQA scores and edit distance and yeah, quality. quality and all these things. Yeah. And I have to tell them, nobody cares about your LQA scores. Nobody cares. What, yeah. they, what they care about is the end user. Right. So if the quality is bad yeah. and the end user finds out, they're going to be mad. But if you try to talk about fuzzy matches and QA scores and all of these things, <laughs> no one's going to care. Yeah. So you got to put it into, yeah. um, you got to translate what you're talking about into a language that works for senior management or works for whatever the stakeholder is yeah. that you're trying to build trust with. Sorry, I kind of went off on a yeah, rant. Yeah, actually, I have an observation myself. Uh, I I kind of feel that normal users they just um, don't care about the uh, quality of the copies. Thank you. Thank you. They care about it when only when. <laughs> No, like, I said thank you because more people need to say that out yeah. loud. I feel like I'm sometimes the only person saying that. Um, my business partner, Renato, got famous a while back, you know, because he would always mm -hmm. say quality doesn't matter, right? Which, I mean, mm -hmm. of course, quality matters, right? It's it's a controversial statement. But <laughs> I've kind of jumped on that bandwagon, and I talk a lot about um, experiential language quality assessment rather than LQA, language quality mm -hmm. assessment. I talk about experiential mm. LQA, XLQA. Mm. And mm. you know, one of the principles behind XLQA is you're not analyzing quality based upon source text, target text. Like how well, because that's yeah. how traditionally we want to measure quality. How well does the translated text match the source text? And I'll tell you, mm. the end user doesn't care how well the translated text matches yeah. the source text. What they care is, are they having a good experience, yeah. right? If it's a Chinese user, based yeah. upon what we learned today, if it's a Chinese user, they care about, am I getting all of the information that I want on one screen? Yeah. Because they yeah. want a can lot I, of information. Can I go, go through all these steps to, to, to finish my user journey? Right, right. And these are the points. Language plays a role in that. Um, but having perfect language doesn't necessarily mean that the user is going to get what they want. So quality and user yeah. experience are related, but user mm -hmm. experience. But vaguely. But vaguely, right? They play into each other. Yeah. But I will prioritize user experience. Um, every day. And what we're seeing now is more mm -hmm. companies 
kind of ditch traditional quality models or at least supplement traditional quality models by focusing more on their end user. So this is a great opportunity for mm -hmm. localization directors or globalization directors out there who want to take a look at yeah. what, how am I adding value to my organization? Well, like I said, mm -hmm. different organizations speak different languages. Some, some organizational yeah. cultures speak the language of data. Some speak the language of finance. Some speak the language of metrics. Some speak the language of technology. So it's going to be different at different organizations. However, the one common thing that's for almost every company, I should is never awareness. say almost, yeah. is awareness and user experience. Yeah. As every company has yeah. an end user, an end client, an end customer, and they should mm -hmm. all care about those. So if we can talk about localization mm -hmm. within the terms of how does it affect the end user, then that's a much more interesting conversation, conversation I would say. Yeah, maybe we can have a panel discussion in the future around it. You host. You host. I'm, I host, I host <laughs> too much. No, I'll, no, no. I'll come speak on your panel and you can ask questions. <laughs> and yeah, I, there's a lot of different opinions out there around this. And I think the, mm. the industry mm. is still kind of figuring out what does quality mean as we move into mm. 2023 and beyond. And there's mm. no set answer out there. So it's an, it's an exciting topic to be talking about. So yeah. speaking of quality, let's, you know, I'll get off of my soapbox here and we'll get back to your slides. Um, speaking of yeah. quality, source, source text quality matters a lot. There, there was a, a slide. Did I miss one? Oh, I missed. This? Oh, yeah. I skipped this yeah. one because it's, it's using the I word, which this is so important. I, I know it's important. <laughs> I know it's important. It's just not my, I'm not an internationalization guy. So I, yeah. I have a lot of respect for the internet. I work with several consultants here at NIMSY who Adam. know a lot about this. <laughs> Adam, Adam Asnes, oh God, I could talk to yeah. him all day, right? I won't understand what he's talking about half yeah. the time. But um, yeah. yeah, internationalization but, but, and the streamlined uh, localization yeah. workflow. Why yeah, is this definitely, important? Uh, many, many tech companies pay attention to this. You say seldom? Uh, but this is so important. Yeah, yeah. Seldomly. I yeah. I would say so, and I I would agree with that based upon my experience, not just in China but everywhere, because um, especially in the companies that aren't born global, as we were talking about, because mm. in those companies the product teams oftentimes, I mean they they call the shots, they they're they're in charge, yeah, and they say this is the mm. way that we're going to develop. And you, localization mm -hmm. managers, need to figure out a way to work with us and work with our code, work with our repositories, work with all of this. And so it creates a ton of work on the localization function. And more importantly, yeah. it introduces errors because if a product isn't internationalized properly, then it's not going to yeah. be, the process is not going to be a great process to localize it. And there's going to be errors introduced to it yeah. and it's yeah. hard to have this i have a recent example of this please i have a recent example of this um i, I talked to a localization uh manager in a tech company in china mm -hmm. and uh, this company it has has been going global for uh, like uh, more than one year okay and uh, uh in this company this girl is the only uh localization professional okay in so there's no department but the only one uh one role and one person and uh, the copy was uh produced by the designer okay <laughs> uh yeah and and most in most cases uh the 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 source copies are produced in, in china tech companies in chinese tech companies are produced by uh Product managers, okay. But in this company, the the copies uh, are produced by the the designer, okay. And in, in Figma, and they have to copy and paste them out. Yeah, not a very fr localization then friendly tool. And to the localization. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and the very traditional, I, I'd say. Um, so they 
Yeah. So so I I I I mean, in China, Chinese tech companies, uh, such operations, uh, regarding local product local localization is very um common, I'd say. Let's um. So I'm looking at the comments here, and we could talk about internationalization all day, every day, but I want to go see. But uh, my, my partner, Renato, did, he says translation is like toilet paper. People only care mm. about toilet paper when it's not there, <laughs> right? And <laughs> that's what we say about translation. Yeah. And This is a really good point, and this is why I need yes. to be careful when I'm saying things like, oh, quality doesn't matter, right? But once again, Daniel, mm -hmm. what you're talking about mm -hmm. here is fundamentally it's user experience, right? So it's the overlap yes. that we were talking yes. about between translation quality and user experience. And you're absolutely right. If I'm on a page yeah. and that page is asking me to put in my credit card information and there's errors... Yeah in it then the yeah. likelihood of me completing that purchase is not very high that's a flagging alert yep yep yes point is like this is kind of what i'm talking about on as localization professionals we need to track metrics that matter right so rather yes. if we if i go to my ceo and say um we have a 60 percent pass rate for LQAs for mm -hmm. French. And they're gonna say, okay, mm -hmm. I don't know what that means. But if I say mm -hmm. we have extremely low um, fulfillment, or what's the term, um, conversion, conversion for shopping cart, mm -hmm. what there's terminology that I'm not using. But you know, people are yeah. abandoning their shopping cart three times more in France than they are in Germany. Yeah. Okay, now I've got people's attention because I'm speaking the language, right? Yeah. I, yeah, that's a whole different panel discussion. You can schedule that panel discussion yeah. too. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. Yeah, and I love talking about gaming localization too because it's mm -hmm. one, especially with like Japanese um, video games being so influential in the gaming space, it's one of the mm -hmm. markets where you can actually have really good conversations about from an English speaker perspective mm -hmm. um, about what mm -hmm. poor localization quality is because us mm -hmm. English speakers are sometimes spoiled because everything not everything, but a lot is created in English. But with video games, you have yeah. developers in other countries too. So we can experience firsthand mm. what it's like to have poor localization. Mm. Cool. Hi, Michael from Chicago. Good to see you. I think we got through all the comments there. <laughs> yes. All, all right. from Chicago. Yeah. Th that was me um, avoiding further conversation about internationalization. We can talk about internationalization issues all day. It's one of the top okay. 10 yeah. top ten concerns that mm -hmm. people are having. We just put together a list of top 10 concerns and it's definitely on the top 10 yeah. you can see from the client side. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about source text quality matters a lot. Yes. I mean, I, That's I especially true for Chinese yeah, I don't think this is a controversial <laughs> statement. I'm like, yep, I agree. We can move on. But so tell me, <laughs> yeah. tell me from the Chinese perspective what this means. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, English language 
or other European languages, uh, they are more logical than uh, Chinese. Not as contextual. Or than uh, East, East Asian languages. Yeah. So, uh, so you know, the chat GPT or GPT, they have a, it has a idea concept of chain of thoughts. So the reason I, 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 I assume that the reason why chat GPT has this uh, feature or characteristic is that English language is mostly logic and uh, the connections between sentences or paragraphs are close closer. Um, so, so for, for copies are, they, they are even shorter phrases in a language. So when a, when a language of less, uh, logic between sentences, uh, meets with the short phrases. And when you want to translate those phrases into another language, things will be, might be a mess. Mm. So, uh, many t Chinese tech companies, they, they want to translate from Chinese to, uh, into other languages directly. But, uh, uh, first the, the, you cannot, you probably cannot find the best linguists in these language pairs from Chinese, from Chinese to in. other, other languages. Right. So yeah. you end up going and, through uh, English. And then, yeah. And going through, uh, English as a pivot language, uh, can, can help you correct or fix some logic errors in the Chinese, uh, in, in the Chinese copies. Because you have to provide that. So context. this will, yeah, yeah. So, so you will, it will make a, a translation into other languages easier. Makes sense. Let's That's my take. Let's go on to, to our last point here, which is your reviewers define yeah. the final output. True for any language. Yeah. True for any language. Yeah. And I always so, say, if you're going to save money, even, save money on the mm. translator, not the reviewer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'd say it's, it's true uh, either for in-house language managers or uh, uh, partner LSP linguists. For both, both sides, uh, it, it, it's, it's true that the, your reviewer defines your quality, final, final output. Very true. Because you, you have to rely on these reviewers to find the a pool of linguists. Well, and your reviewers oftentimes become more than just reviewers. They become your brand voice in different markets. They become, because yeah. they're going to have the yeah. final say on things like terminology, things like consistency, and... Um, style guides. Style guides. Mm -hmm. And consistency, you know, consistency is going back to the user experience, right? Users expect um, yes. a similar experience. It's like when I go to Starbucks and I order a mm -hmm. caramel macchiato, I can go to a Starbucks in mm -hmm. Spain and order, well, maybe not, let's keep it in the U.S. I can go to Starbucks in Miami, Florida and order a caramel macchiato. I can go mm -hmm. to a Starbucks in Seattle, Washington, on the other side of the country, and order a caramel macchiato. It's a consistent mm -hmm. experience, right? And this is what people expect from their content as well and their product localization, yeah. right? Yeah. They don't want yeah. they want to have a consistent experience. And the reviewer is the one with the keys to the consistent user experience. And tools. And yeah. tools, yeah. And and there's all sorts of technology out there these days that are helping with that as well. Yeah. So let's talk about the bright side of product localization in China. Oh, it's a blank yeah. page. Actually, uh, <laughs> I feel, I feel better and better. Yeah. I feel better and better, uh, now, uh, than before. Because, How so? Uh, with more companies are going global, there are obviously more needs for a lo product localization. Job security. And, uh, with all these successful brands overseas. So localization, awareness of localization is greatly uh, boosted. It's yeah. the and, uh, a rising tide raises all ships, right? 
the more that we can boost localization yeah. in one country, one market, one company, the more we're a very competitive industry with the, ourselves, right? And I know this because I talk <laughs> yes. to you know part of my job at NIMSI is we're talking to um, client side localization directors all over the world, right? And the one yeah. thing that they all want to know is how how are they doing it at my competitors? How are they doing it? At, this, these other companies, right? Yeah. And this is why we do a lot of research into that. We have a whole series uh, called Lessons in Localization where we, we publish briefings mm -hmm. on um, how different companies do localization, right? So they, um, yeah. we learn from each other. And it's not because we're being sneaky, but it's because we love learning from each other, right? So more needs, mm -hmm. more awareness, more talents. We have Loc Lunch now. Do you have a Loc Lunch now? Yeah, we 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 had uh, we had lock launch in Beijing uh, with the help of Marcello. Nice. Uh, uh, yeah, and in in the past, but uh, when after he left China, uh, there there was a a gap Vacuum. before. But now we have a we have Nick as the localization lock launch ambassador in Beijing. Very cool. Uh, so uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The next lock launch will happen in ten days. Nice. Yeah. Local lunch is a great program. And we have one here in Seattle, mm -hmm. I think. Andre Cubero um, and Sako Eaton here in Seattle, they, they are organizing the local lunches these days here in Seattle. And it's a great program. Mm -hmm. Plug for local lunch. I'm not on their payroll, but if you're listening and you're not, you're not aware of local lunch, find a chapter uh -huh. next to you. But it's really just one yeah. of the community building tools that we have available in our industry. You know, this is a yeah. people yeah. driven industry. So now I think we have something. Yeah. Yeah. We, we have Loke lunch. Mm -hmm. We have gala. We have Loke world. We have Taos. I'm not sure if they're still doing events. We have global Saki. I was just talking to Talia, emailing her. Um, we have, now I got to keep going because people are going to be mad if I don't mention them. Yes. But so, so many different opportunities to meet and network. And this is why I like doing these live streams because you get people together from all over the world. We can talk to them in the comments and stuff like that. And now that the, the pandemic is over, yeah. we actually yes. get to meet each other again. And it's lovely. So... Well, I think yes. that brings us to yes. the end of... That's that's very happy thing. Yeah, th thank you so mm -hmm. much. Like I said, you make my job as a host very easy by providing this wonderful, <laughs> um, organized presentation for us to go through. If, if only all of my guests were so accommodating, I'd probably yeah. still have some I'm too excited <laughs> to join you. Any, any, um, yeah. But we are kind of running out of time here. Any closing thoughts as we... Start wrapping mm -hmm. up. Um, I think I think Chinese tech companies or Chinese uh, product localization uh, professionals needs to learn from uh, overseas companies um, a lot, and uh, I think we can uh, communicate more in the future and uh, learn from each other more uh, to about the best practices and lessons learned. Um, I think Nimsy is a is 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 one of the best partners that we we have in the industry globally. So uh, maybe in the future we can talk more about it. We're doing what we can. And, uh, chat. We're doing what yeah. we can. And Michael Michael yeah. from Chicago mentioned some women in localization. Uh -huh. I don't know how I forgot about women in localization, but that's another good organization out there as well. Yes. Yes. Right. Yeah. So mm. here, here, I, I appreciate those closing thoughts mm. very much. Um, I'm going to start wrapping us up here. Uh, ladies, gentlemen, thank you very much. We are out of time today. If you've enjoyed this episode of Nimsy Live, then join us tomorrow. Tomorrow morning, uh, West Coast time, we are going to be talking with... Jonas Ryberg and Wei Zhang from Scientific. And it's a really interesting topic. I'm really excited to talk to them about it because we're talking about more with less. I know you've heard this more with less before, but um, right now with the economy, economic downturns, all the chaos going on, 
we have some really interesting perspectives on how localization managers are able to do more with less i.e more localization less budgets if that sounds like a challenge that you've had then join us tomorrow morning live here if you're not already signed up once again and finally my name is tucker johnson host of nimsy live it has been my pleasure to join you all today i appreciate our guest zhang jun um for sharing his insights you, with us tucker. Thank you very much. I appreciate all of you guys taking part in chat. I appreciate everybody in industry who fills out all of those surveys. We have a new survey, go check it out, um, to power the research so that we can share the experience with the rest of the industry. And especially all the comments, questions, and criticisms from chat. Anybody who left comments, thank you very much. I hope I was able to mention each one of you. Um, Tucker Johnson, Nimsy Insights. I look forward to seeing you again next time. Cheers. Thank you.